This video is the third part of the Vinberg lecture on um, Vinberg's algorithm and Katz Moody algebras. Uh, it might not make a whole lot of sense unless you've seen the first two parts of the lecture, so I'll put links to them in the description of the video below. Um, now, if I think of it, it might not make a lot of sense even if you have seen the first two parts of the lecture. Um, what we're going to discuss in this lecture is um, whether you can assign nicely algebras to Vinberg's groups. So to recall what we did in the first two parts of this lecture, um, Vinberg um, looked at the lattices i n comma 1, so this is the um, uh, odd unimodular Lorentzian lattice consisting of all numbers m1 up to mn, mn plus 1, with all the m i in z, and m1 squared plus plus mn squared minus mn plus 1 squared um, is the norm of this vector, the square of its length. You notice there's a minus sign here. And Vinberg calculated the Dinkin diagrams of the reflection groups. And you remember he found these rather intriguing diagrams that um, you know, two of them looked like this, for example. Um, now, um, there's one obvious way to get Dinkin diagrams, which is that if you take a Lie algebra, um, the Lie algebra, you might want it to be finite dimensional and semi-simple, then this gives you a Dinkin diagram. For example, if we take the Lie algebra um, of all um, n by n matrices over the reals, then this gives us a Dinkin diagram which looks like this with n minus 1 points. So this is the A n minus 1 Dinkin diagram. Um, and um, we can ask, do the Din do, do Vinberg's Dinkin diagrams also correspond to various Lie algebras? So, so um, what happens is we, we can look at spherical um, reflection groups, and these correspond to the usual finite dimensional Lie algebras. It's the finite dimensional semi-simple Lie algebras. And we also looked at Euclidean reflection groups. I can't spell Euclidean, Euclidean reflection groups. And these give um, the so-called affine um, Lie algebras, more or less. So a typical example of this would be the group of n by n matrices with coefficients that are Laurent polynomials um, in the reals. Actually, that's not quite true. There's a, there's a little extra fuss you have to do about the centre of the Lie algebra, but I won't worry about this. And finally, you can ask, what about hyperbolic reflection groups. So for example, we could look at Vinberg's examples of the lattices I, N1 and the even um, lattice um, I, I, N1. And we can ask, what Lie algebras do these uh, give rise to? Um, and I'll be discussing this lecture, um, what we want to put here. Um, so um, Katz and Moody gave one answer to this. What they found was a way of associating any Dinkin to any Dinkin diagram um, some sort of Lie algebra. It's called a Katz Moody algebra. And so for the finite dimensional Euclidean Dinkin diagrams, this gives the finite dimensional and Euclidean Lie algebras. So what we need to do is to see how do you get from a Dinkin diagram to a Lie algebra. So what does a Dinkin diagram look like? Well, a Dinkin diagram has a bunch of points. Um, and the points have various numbers of lines between them. And um, the way you get from a Dinkin diagram to a Lie algebra is as follows. First of all, for any point, 
you, you get a copy of the Lie Algebra SL2. So that's just little two by two matrices, A, B, C, D with A plus D equals zero under the usual Lie bracket. Um, and the lines between the points tell you how these two little copies of SL2 interact. For example, if you have two points like this, this means that the two corresponding copies of SL2 commute with each other. Um, if you have two um, copies of SL2 and a, and a single line between them, then what happens, this means the two copies of SL2 don't quite commute, they sort of interact um, in the way that um, the, the two, well, there, there are two obvious copies of SL2. There's one copy here and there's another copy there. And you see they sort of overlap in some sense. And um, a line between two copies of SL2 means they overlap in this sense. And if you if you assign more lines, then more complicated things happen. Um, well, that's a sort of rather informal way of describing the um, the algebra of a Dinkin diagram. Um, more precisely, you can write down the harish chandra serre relations. So what we do is we take numbers E, I, F, I and H, I for each point. So these are going to be generators of the Lie algebra. And now we want some relations telling you how these generators fit together. So the relations look like this. First of all, H, I, H, J commute with each other. This means the H, I, um, if, if you take all the H, I's, they form an abelian Lie algebra called the Cartan algebra. Cartan subalgebra. The Lie algebra. Um, the Cartan subalgebra sort of behaves a bit like the diagonal matrices of um, of um, the, 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 the n by n matrices. Um, um, next, we introduce um, relations saying what the e i's um, and the h i's interact, how, how they interact with each other. So we have h i e j equals a i j e j and h i f j is minus a i j f j, where, where these numbers a i j are mysterious constants making up something called the Cartan matrix. And the Cartan matrix is determined by the number of lines between points in the Lie algebra. Um, so what's going on here is this says the numbers E, E, J and H, J, sorry, E, J and F, J are eigenvectors of the Cartan subalgebra H. So let's call capital H for the abelian Lie algebra generated by this. And this just means they're eigenvectors. Um, in the case of the general linear group, the EIs and the FJs are things that live just above or just below the diagonal. So you can think of um, the EIs would have um, a non-zero entry in one of these positions. And the FIs would have a non-zero entry in one of these positions and be the um, um, zero somewhere else. So, so the E i's and the so the H i's sort of give you the diagonal entries, and the E i's and the F i's give you the the entries that are just above or just below the diagonal. Um, next, we have some more relations saying E i F j equals naught for i not equal to j, and H i if i is equal to j. And what this relation says is that the the, the Generators E i, F i, and H i um, form a little subalgebra that looks like S L two of the real. So it's the three dimensional the algebra that everybody knows about. And uh, in matrix form, these are uh, just the little two by two blocks on the diagonal. So a typical one of these Lie algebras might look like a two by two block there. Um, so these are the 
um, relations that are easy to understand, we also have some rather more complicated relations, um, one of which says that EI, EI, so on, EI, EJ is equal to zero and the same for the FIs. Um, so what do these say? Well, um, first of all, you have to say how many EIs you put there, but it turns out it doesn't really matter how many EIs you put there. I mean, people have some complicated formula depending on these numbers A, I, J, but in fact, it turns out that provided you've got a sufficiently large number of EIs, that, that, that all these relations are equivalent. And what these say is that the operations um, taking a lead bracket with EI um, or with FI are locally nil potent. Um, what this means is they're not quite nil potent, but they're nil potent if you sort of apply them to any finite dimensional subspace. In, in the finite dimensional case, this says they are actually nil potent. Um, this is very nice because it means that um, when you act with SL2R on the Katz Moody algebra, the Katz Moody algebra splits up as a sum of finite dimensional representations of SL2R, which is good because we know all about the finite dimensional representations of SL2R. So the, these relations sort of say the Katz Moody algebra behaves very nicely as a representation of all these SL2Rs. Um, so Katz and Moody pointed out you could take any Dinkin diagram whatsoever, just write down these relations, and this gives you a Lie algebra. And as I said, for the finite dimensional um, reflection groups, this gives you finite dimensional Lie algebras, and for um, affine reflection groups, this gives you the, the, the affine Lie algebras. So this gives us one answer to our question. Um, if we've got any hyperbolic reflection group, we get a Dinkin diagram, and from the Dinkin diagram, we get a Katz Moody algebra. So, well, that seems to answer the question, but it's not an entirely satisfactory answer because it turns out the Katz Moody algebras you get are kind of a bit wild and difficult to understand. And what we'd really like is a nice Lie algebra here. And the question is, what do we mean by a nice Lie algebra? Well, everybody agrees the finite dimensional Lie algebras and the affine Lie algebras are nice. So, um, um, let's see what's nice about them. Well, what's nice about them is we can write down an explicit character formula, um, which was discovered by Hermann Weyl, and it's called the Weyl character formula um, for finite dimensional ones. Well, um, Katz noted that it could be extended to all um, Katz Moody algebras to the Weyl Katz formula. Um, it's not completely straightforward extending it because if you look at all the proofs of the Weyl character formula in finite dimensions, none of them actually work if the, if, if the Lie algebra is infinite dimensional. But, but Katz discovered that if you take one of these proofs and kind of stretch it a little bit, you can get it to work for infinite dimensions. Um, the, the, the problem Katz, the main problem Katz had to solve is, is this proof used the Casimir operator, which doesn't quite make sense for infinite dimensional Lie algebras, but Katz discovered a clever way to, to um, regularize it so it did make sense and was the, the, then able to push through uh, uh, the proof. Um, now, I'm going to be most interested in the case of the character formula for the one dimensional trivial representation. It sounds kind of stupid writing down the character formula for the one dimensional representation because. We know the character of the one-dimensional representation. Um, but the um, Wildcat's character formula says that the character of a, of a representation is equal to a certain sum over a certain product. And this is rather nice because if we know the character is one, then we're going to get a nice identity saying the sum, a certain sum, is equal to a certain product. Um, so we get an identity saying the sum is a product. 
which is um, the, the via denominator formula. And the via denominator formula looks like this. And what we do is we take a sum over um, something called the vial group. And this is equal to a product uh, of um, over something where these are something called the positive roots. And rho that appears all over the place here and here is something called the vial vector. Uh, this is this is just a, a sine plus or minus one depending on the determinant of of the element of the vial group. Um, so um, I just give a couple of examples of the vial denominator formula for finite dimensional and affine algebras. So so for finite dimensions, the vial denominator formula is just the van der Monde identity, at least for the Lie algebras um, A and minus 1. Um, so you remember the van der Monde identity says if you've got a matrix 1, 1, 1, um, x0, x1, x2, y0, x0 squared, x1 squared, x2 squared, and you want to know its determinant, this is the product over i less than j of xi minus xj up to a sign which I always get wrong. And you see what we have here is a product um, over i less than j, and you can see that i less than j corresponds to three upper triangle entries here, which are the three positive roots of, of a little two by two matrix. Um, and the sum is over, um, it would be, if you expand out this determinant, you get six terms which correspond to the six entries of the symmetric group S3 on, on three points. And this is just the vial group of, um, of um, the Lie algebra of three by three matrices. So, so here this is really a sum over the vial group. And this is a product over positive roots. So the usual van der Monde identity is a typical example of the vial denominator formula in finite dimensions. Um, the simplest example of the vial denominator formula for affine algebras is the famous Jacobi triple product identity. And to get the Jacobi triple product identity, what you do is you draw this picture here. Um, and what this is, is it's really the root system of, um, it, it's, it's the root system of SL2R with coefficients that are Laurent polynomials. Um, so um, here, what we have is the root system of SL2R, and it sort of gets shifted to the right or the left whenever you, whenever you sort of multiply by Z. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take the positive roots to be these points here. And to each positive root, I'm going to assign um, a factor as follows. So this is going to be, um, here I'm going to put 1 minus q squared, 1 minus q to the 4, and so on. So here I'm going to put 1 minus qz, here I'm going to put 1 minus qz to the minus 1, here I'm going to put 1 minus q, q cubed z to the minus 1, here 1 minus q cubed z, and so on. So what we get is a big product that looks like the product over n greater than 0, of 1 minus q to the 2n, 1 minus q to the 2n minus 1z, 1 minus q to the 2n minus 1z to the minus 1. And if you expand out this product, 
um, what you would mostly expect to get is some sort of a horrible complicated mess um, it's fairly obvious that all the terms of this product when you expand it out are going to lie inside a certain parabola and normally you'd expect to have something very complicated on the inside but it turns out that all terms inside the parabola vanish what's happening is there's a sort of massive amounts of cancellation going on so what we're left with is the terms that are exactly on the parabola which are easy to work out it's, it's just sum over n of minus one to the n q to the n squared z to the n um so it's very easy to remember this identity if you remember this picture of the um, root lattice of of this Lie algebra here. Then the, the, then the product is just the positive roots, and the sum is just the sum over the boundary of the obvious region containing the terms of this product. Um, and Macdonald found such identities for all the other affine root systems. They're called the Macdonald identities. Uh, many of them were sort of found by Dyson, who sort of overlooked the connection with the Lie algebras, in a, which he was very frustrated by. Um, so, um, uh, MacDonald came up with these identities slightly before um, affine Katz Moody algebras were, were, were well known. And Katz sort of said that um, when he looked at the MacDonald identities and looked at affine Lie algebras it was just sort of immediately obvious that the Macdonald identities were the denominator formula for the affine Katz Moody algebras so that was a, a, a gave a very nice explanation um, the, 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 the Macdonald identities were originally a bit puzzling because um, the sum was uh, the product was not only over the roots of the um, affine reflection group which were these terms and these terms but there were some extra terms here which were a bit puzzling but these turned out to be the, um, the norm zero roots of the corresponding affine algebra um, so um, um, the reason why we get nice identities is we know, um, first of all, we know the simple roots. Now, knowing the simple roots tells us what the vile group is, it's just the reflection group of the simple group, and this tells us what the sum is in the vile denominator formula. Um, we also need to know the root multiplicities. Um, I didn't quite um, make these obvious, but if you um, go back to the vile denominator formula, we should really um, take several factors if the root alpha has multiplicity greater than one. So there should really be a factor here where you put in the multiplicity of alpha. So we also know the root multiplicities in both the finite dimensional and affine cases. And this tells us what the product is in the vile denominator formula um, and now the problem is that if we write down a dinkin diagram we certainly know what the simple roots are but the root multiplicities seem to be very complicated um, in general now um, for finite dimensional algebras they're easy they're just one for affine algebras they're not much more complicated they're usually either one or the rank or something I mean, something a bit related. They're, they're easy to describe. Um, so what do the root multiplicities of these um, more general katz moody algebras look like? Well, well, people did a lot of computer calculations, and there are some examples in um, Katz's book. So here's um, root multiplicities of a little rank 2 Lie algebra, and if you look at them, the multiplicities 
you know, it's, it's rather hard to say anything much about them. Let, let me just magnify a bit so you can see. So if I zoom in a bit, so you can see the multiplicities. Um, I mean, they're not too difficult to calculate by computer, but it's hard to say anything very interesting about them. I and mean, you can write down asymptotic formula for them to some extent. Um, a more interesting case is was done by Frankel and Feingold, who looked at this rank three Lie algebra. Um, oops. This rank three Lie algebra. Uh, this turns up as the reflection group of the modular group. So, so its its var group is is um, essentially just GL two over the integers. Um, and if you look at the multiplicities. Um, something quite interesting has happened. First of all, you see that various numbers are repeating quite often. So we've got the number 30 appearing three times for three different orbits of roots. And then we get numbers 42 appearing three times and 56 and so on. And if you look at the multiplicities, well, there's a sequence 2, 3, 5, 7, 11. And every number theorist will immediately recognize these numbers as the as, as as the values of the partition function um they're also primes for the first few but that's just a coincidence they're really values of the partition function um so what's the partition function well the partition function is just the number of ways of writing a number as a sum of um positive integers so, so the partition um numbers look like this and for example um, the fourth entry is five and that's because we can write four is equal to four or three plus one or two plus two or two plus one plus one or one plus one plus one plus one um, and these numbers are usually denoted by p n and Euler found this very nice formula for p of n the sum of p n times q to the n is just equal to product over n greater than zero, one over one minus q to the n. So it's one over one minus q, one over one minus q squared, and so on. So that looks very exciting. We, we, we've we got a lot of numerical evidence that we're getting um, the partition function appearing here, except we don't. If you go on further, um, you know, you, you go up to here, for example, and let me zoom in again, you can see one of the coefficients is 627 but the other is only 626 so we're getting the partition function for quite a long way except it suddenly starts breaking down and as you as you go further it, it, it breaks down more and more so we've got something rather puzzling going on here it almost looks as if we've got a nice formula for the multiplicity but then it goes wrong um so um, I will explain later on why um, why this Lie algebra almost has root multiplicities that are given by the partition function. Um, well, um, the most striking um, hyperbolic reflection group was Conway's reflection group. So you remember Conway calculated the reflection group of the 26 dimensional even Lorentzian lattice and found that its Dinkin diagram is just the Leach lattice. Um, for details, see the second part of this lecture. So the obvious thing to do is to look at the what are the multiplicities of um, the corresponding Katz Moody algebra. So we're taking the whole Leach lattice as a Dinkin diagram. So it's got an infinite number of vertices and it's sort of very complicated. And looking at its Katz Moody algebra, and Igor Frankel made this absolutely amazing discovery. He showed that multiplicities of um, a root alpha um, is at most p24 of um, 1 minus alpha squared over 2. So what's p24? Well, the sum of p24n q to the n is the product over n greater than 0 of 1 
over 1 minus q to the n to the 24. So it's like the partition function, except you've got this 24th power here. So, so, so these, the, this, this series, the numbers get big quite quickly. So it's 1 plus 24q plus 324q squared and so on. Um, and furthermore, he showed that there are lots of vectors that have exactly this multiplicity. So we get equality if um, alpha beta equals 1, where beta squared is equal to 0, and beta does not correspond to the Leech lattice. So you remember there are 23 orbits of vectors of norm 0 corresponding to 23 Niemeyer lattices. And if a root is in a product 1 with at least one of those, then the multiplicity is exactly 24. Um, if, if beta does correspond to the Leech lattice, the multiplicity is actually becomes less than um, this number here. Um, and the way Igor Frankel proved this is he used string theory. Um, more precisely, he used the no ghost theorem from string theory, which um, predicts the dimension of some sort of space of strings to be given by this number here in, in 26 dimensions. So the, um, you know, string theory has this problem that it predicts space time as 26 dimensions, which is a real headache for physicists, but is really great for mathematicians because it's exactly the right dimension for this lattice here, as, as, as Igor Frankel discovered. Um, so we can also ask how how good is 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 Eagle Frankel's upper bound for other vectors? Um, well, let's take a look at some um, um, vectors alpha in the twenty six dimensional even Renzi lattice and see what the multiplicity is. So if alpha squared is equal to two. And then there's one orbit, and the and the multiplicity is just one, so so it's exact. If alpha squared equals zero, then there are 24 times infinity orbits. Um, that's because there are 24 orbits of primitive norm zero vectors, and you can multiply any of them by a positive integer. And for 23 of these, the multiplicity is equal to 24, and for one the multiplicity is equal to zero. That's the leak that is causing trouble. If alpha squared is equal to minus two, then things start getting really complicated. There are 121 orbits, and you can work out the multiplicity for each of these. And it turns out 119 have multiplicity 324, exactly equal to Frankel's upper bound, and two of them have multiplicity slightly less. And for alpha squared is minus 4, it's similar. So there are 665 orbits, and most of them have multiplicity 3,200, which is the next coefficient. And there's a small handful which have multiplicity slightly less. Um, and you see this is suspiciously similar to what was happening with the example calculated by Feingold and Frenkel, that many of the roots have multiplicities given by some nice coefficient, but eventually the, the roots start having multiplicity a little bit less than that. So something is almost working, but starts to break down after a while. And so how can we explain this? Well, this, this gives a strong hint. There is a slightly larger Lie algebra with multiplicities exactly um, p24 of 1 minus alpha squared over 2. Um, and um, what can this Lie algebra be? Well, it can't be a katz moody algebra because um, that doesn't quite work. But it turns out you can generalise the notion of the Katz-Moody algebra. So this is a generalisation of Katz-Moody algebras. 
And the generalization is quite simple. So the Katz Moody algebra um, depends on these numbers a i j and has and and it always assumes that a i i is equal to two whenever i i is whenever so whenever two of these entries are the same then the diagonal entry is two um, and this corresponds to the fact that all simple roots have norm greater than zero the simple root is closer the norm of the simple root is closer related to a i j the, the exact way depends on how you normalize things um, well what we should do is we can also allow a i i to be less than or equal to zero and most of the theory of katz moody algebras goes through with some slight changes so 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 these correspond to so-called imaginary simple roots Um, where the norm is less than or equal to naught. The, the term imaginary is a bit unfortunate because it conflicts with another use for the term imaginary in, in the theory of Lie algebras. Here the term imaginary means the, the, the norm, which is roughly the square root of a i i up to some real factor, is an imaginary number rather than a real number. Um, and we need to modify the relation slightly. Um, so if um, a i i is less than equal to naught. We discard the relations that say e i, e i, and so on, e j is equal to naught. And of course, we discard the ones for f i and so on. Um, we just keep a tiny piece of them. We keep the relation e i, f j equals zero if um, a i j equals zero. So. Um, um, other than that, the um, relations are very similar to the relations for Katz Moody algebras. And again, the, the, the whole theory of Katz Moody algebras extends this slightly more general case. In particular, we get a, a, a character formula and a denominator formula, which is a little bit more complicated because these simple root, the, the imaginary simple roots give some extra correction terms. Um, so, um, Another way of thinking of the difference is that these um, simple roots of a i i equals 2 all correspond to copies of SL2 of R, as we saw earlier. The simple roots with a i i equals 0 correspond to copies of the Heisenberg algebra, which is another three-dimensional Lie algebra. It's a sort of degeneration of SL2 in some sense. Um, or we can, uh, that the, the ones with AII less than zero also correspond to copies of SL2 of R, except that um, the, uh, I mentioned earlier that the Katz Moody algebra is a sum of finite dimensional representations of this SL2 R. Well, if AII is less than zero, this is no longer true, and the Katz Moody algebra is in general a sum of infinite dimensional discrete series representations of SL2. So there are some differences, but most of the theory goes through. Um, and so we can ask, can we find um, a Lie algebra um, corresponding to these, one of these more general forms of Katz Moody algebra? And we can. So the Lie algebra can be described as follows. So this is going to be the root lattice. And for each of these vectors, we need to describe the multiplicity. And the multiplicity of alpha is going to be p of 1 minus 20, 1, p, sorry, p24 of 1 minus alpha squared over 2 for alpha not 0, and 26 if alpha is equal to 0. Um, so this is a, a, a really hugely algebra. If we sort of draw the light cone, Then um, uh, here it's got a lot of vectors of norm 2, each of which has multiplicity 1. And then it's got a bunch of vectors of norm 0 on the light cone, each with multiplicity 24. And this light cone is you know, living in 26-dimensional Lorentzian space. And then it's got some more 
vectors lying on the surface of um, vectors with alpha squared equals minus 2. And these vectors, all the vectors lying on here, have multiplicity um, 324. And then there are more vectors lying on the next surface above it, all with multiplicity 3200. And then as you go further up, the multiplicities get bigger and bigger and bigger. So this Lie algebra has a very narrow waist in some sense, but it get, gets huge up here and it gets huge down there. Um, and we can ask, what is its denominator formula? And you can write down its denominator formula explicitly. It looks like this. First of all, we take a sum over the vial group and um, we take the sine and then we take omega of sum over tau n of e to the n rho um, and this is equal to e to the rho times the product over alpha greater than zero one minus e to the alpha to the mult of alpha and this multiplicity is just given by this expression here um, and what's going on is this looks just like the denominator formula or finite dimensional affine Lie algebras, except we've got these extra correction terms. These come from the imaginary um, simple roots. Here, tau of n is Ramanujan's tau function. You remember it's defined like this. So sum of tau n q to the n is just q times product of 1 minus q to the n to the 24, which is, you know, it's minus 24q squared and so on. So, um, 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 so this counts as a nicely algebra because we have a simple expression for both the simple roots that are just given by points of the Leach lattice and the root multiplicities they're just given by um, this values of p24. Um, now we can ask, can we find similarly algebras for the other reflection groups? And this turns out to be rather difficult. Um, there's one case in which you can do this. Suppose we take an automorphism sigma of the Leech lattice. Um, actually, strictly speaking, we don't take an automorphism of the Leech lattice. We take an automorphism of a certain double cover of the Leech lattice, but uh, I'm not going to worry about that too much. And we can look at the fixed point lattice, lambda sigma, where we just take all points of the Leech lattice fixed by sigma. Um, then this lattice behaves in a way that's very similar to the Leech lattice. Um, in particular, we can find reflection groups whose Dinkin diagram is not quite this lattice, but something similar. So what we can do is we can take things like lambda sigma plus um, um, a little two-dimensional Lorentzian lattice plus a little two-dimensional, sorry, a little two-dimensional lattice with um, some other number there. And this... Um, is similar to the um, 26 dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. In particular, you can define its reflection group, and the Dinkin diagram turns out to be described in terms of several cosets of this fixed sublattice. Um, and Peter Neiman looked at this for um, certain sigma of prime order and worked out the corresponding denominator formulas you get. And when sigma has order 23, um, you find something really quite interesting. Uh, the fixed sublattice lambda sigma has dimension equal to 2, um, and um, it uh, has determinant 23. Um, and so I don't know what that's doing there. And the corresponding Lorentzian lattice 
contains um, the lattice of um, 2 um, minus 2 minus 2 2 minus 1 minus 1 2 and this is was the lattice studied by Frenkel and Feingold so just recall that Frenkel and Feingold were studying the lattice corresponding to this Cartan matrix or this lattice and that was the one whose root multiplicities were given by values of the partition function um, so here this lattice is now going to be four-dimensional but it's containing this three-dimensional lattice um, and what Peter Neiman found was that the Lie algebra um, corresponding to this um, two-dimensional fixed sub-lattice of lambda has root multiplicities Um, related to the coefficients of 1 over eta of tau, 1 over eta of 23 tau. Well, what's eta of tau? Well, eta of tau is equal to q to the 1 over 24 times um, product of 1 minus q to the n um, to the 1, where n is greater than 0. Where Q is equal to e to the 2 pi i tau. Um, now you notice the um, coefficients of this are going to be very similar to the coefficients of the partition function. So, so this is going to give you Q to the minus 1 over 24 times 1 plus Q plus 2Q squared plus 3Q cubed and so on, where these are the values of the partition function. And then we need to multiply it by eta of 23 tau, which is going to give us 1 plus q to the 23 plus um, 2q to the 46 and so on. Um, it's, uh, yes, we should have a q to the minus 23 over 24. And what now you see that what's going on here is the coefficients. So the first 23 coefficients are given by the values of the partition function but after that they start getting a little bit bigger than the partition function um, by the way the root multiplicities aren't always given exactly by the coefficients of this function there's, uh, uh, there's something a little bit it, it's a little bit more complicated but i i won't go into exact details so so many of the coefficients are given by by the but by, by the coefficients of this function um so um, this sort of explains the root multiplicities found by Frenkel and Feingold. It turns out that these numbers here aren't really values of the partition function. They're really coefficients of this function here. Um, and the Lie algebra we should be looking at is not quite this one, but a certain rank 4 Lie algebra that contains this as a, as a very large um, subspace. Um, I should say, by the way, that, 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 that Frenkel doesn't agree with me that this explains his results. He wants to see a, um, a Lie algebra whose coefficients are given exactly by the partition function, not by this slightly modified form. Um, so um, Neil Scheithauer has systematically looked at um, all the um, automorphisms of the Leach lattice um, with a non-trivial fixed point sublattice and described the Lie algebras you get from all of these. So, so we get a whole family of Lie algebras whose root multiplicities and simple roots are known explicitly, um, parameterized by certain um, elements of Conway's group of symmetries of the Leach lattice. So this gives you a family of reflection groups um, related to similar to Conway's reflection group, all of which are related to very nicely algebras. Um, well, next you can ask, what about Vinberg's other reflection groups? So, so Vinberg also found reflection groups of, say, the E10 Dinkin diagram for the 10-dimensional even Lorentzian lattice. And you can ask, do these correspond to 
nicely algebras? Um, and the answer is yes. And I will be discussing this in, in, in the final part of this lecture in the next video. And the key point here is that to construct these Lie algebras, we need to use automorphic forms. Um, so I'll be explaining the relation of Vinberg's reflection groups to certain automorphic forms.